Chamblo by C.L. Moore. Man has conquered space before. You may be sure of that. Somewhere beyond the Egyptians, in that dimness out of which comes echoes of half-mythical names, Atlantis, Mu, somewhere back of history's first beginnings, there must have been an age when mankind, like us today, built cities of steel to house its star-roving ships and knew the names of the planets in their own native tongues. Heard Venus's people call their wet world Sha'ar Dol in that soft, sweet, slurring speech and mimicked Mars guttural Lakdis from the harsh tongues of Mars dryland dwellers. You may be sure of it. Man has conquered space before, and out of that conquest, faint, faint echoes run still through a world that has forgotten the very fact of a civilization which must have been as mighty as our own. There have been too many myths and legends for us to doubt it. The myth of the Medusa, for instance, can never have had its roots in the soil of Earth. That tale of the snake-haired Gorgon, whose gaze turned the gazer to stone, never originated about any creature that Earth nourished. And those ancient Greeks who told the story must have remembered, dimly and half-believing, a tale of antiquity about some strange being from one of the outlying planets their remotest ancestors once trod. Chamblo! Ha! Chamblo! The wild hysteria of the mob rocketed from wall to wall of Lakdarl's narrow streets, and the storming of heavy boots over the slag-red pavement made an ominous undernote to that swelling bay. Chamblo! Chamblo! Northwest Smith heard it coming and stepped into the nearest doorway, laying a weary hand on his heat gun's grip and his colorless eyes narrowed. Strange sounds were common enough in the streets of Earth's latest colony on Mars, a raw, red little town where anything might happen, and very often did. But Northwest Smith, whose name is known and respected in every dive and wild outpost on a dozen wild planets, was a cautious man despite his reputation. He set his back against the wall and gripped his pistol and heard the rising shout come nearer and nearer. Then into his range of vision flashed a red running figure, dodging like a hunted hare from shelter to shelter in the narrow street. It was a girl, a berry brown girl in a single tattered garment whose scarlet burnt the eyes with its brilliance. She ran wearily and he could hear her gasping breath from where he stood. As she came into view, he saw her hesitate and lean one hand against the wall for support and glance wildly around for shelter. She must not have seen him in the depths of the doorway, for as the bay of the mob grew louder and the pounding of the feet sounded almost at the corner, she gave a despairing little moan and dodged into the recess at his very side. When she saw him standing there, tall and leather brown, hand on his heat gun, she sobbed once, inarticulately, and collapsed at his feet, a huddle of burning scarlet and bare brown limbs. Smith had not seen her face, but she was a girl and sweetly made and in danger. And though he had not the reputation of a chivalrous man, something in her hopeless huddle at his feet touched the cord of sympathy for the underdog that stirs in every earth man. And he pushed her gently into the corner behind him and jerked out his gun, just as the first of the running mob rounded the corner. It was a motley crowd. Earthmen and Martians and a sprinkling of Venusian swampmen and strange nameless denizens of unnamed planets, a typical Lakdaral mob. When the first of them turned the corner and saw the empty street before them, there was a faltering in the rush, and the foremost spread out and began to search the doorways on both sides of the street. Looking for something? Smith's sardonic call sounded clear above the clamor of the mob. They turned. The shouting died for a moment as they took in the scene before them. Tall Earthman in the Space Explorer's leathern garb, all one color from the burning of savage suns, save for the sinister pallor of his no-colored eyes in a scarred and resolute face, gun in his steady hand, and the scarlet girl crouched behind him, panting. The foremost of the crowd, a burly Earthman in tattered leather from which the patrol insignia had been ripped away, stared for a moment with a strange expression of incredulity on his face, overspreading the savage exultation of the chase. Then he let loose a deep-throated bellow, Chamblo! and lunged forward. 
Behind him, the mob took up the cry again, Shamblo! 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 and surged after. Smith, lounging negligently against the wall, arms folded and gun hand draped over his left forearm, looked incapable of swift motion, but at the leader's first forward step, the pistol swept in a practiced half circle, and the dazzle of blue-white heat leaping from its muzzle seared an arc in the slag pavement at his feet. It was an old gesture, and not a man in the crowd but understood it. The foremost recoiled swiftly against the surge of those in the rear, and for a moment there was confusion as the two tides met and struggled. Smith's mouth curled into a grim curve as he watched. The man in the mutilated patrol uniform lifted a threatening fist and stepped to the very edge of the deadline, while the crowd rocked to and fro behind him. "'Are you crossing that line?' queried Smith in an ominously gentle voice. "'We want that girl!' Come and get her. Recklessly, Smith grinned into his face. He saw danger there, but his defiance was not the foolhardy gesture it seemed. An expert psychologist of mobs from long experience, he sensed no murder here. Not a gun had appeared in any hand in the crowd. They desired the girl with an inexplicable bloodthirstiness he was at a loss to understand, but toward himself he sensed no such fury. A mauling he might expect, but his life was in no danger. Guns would have appeared before now if they were coming out at all. So he grinned in the man's angry face and leaned lazily against the wall. Behind their self-appointed leader, the crowd milled impatiently and threatening voices began to rise again. Smith heard the girl moan at his feet. What do you want with her? He demanded. She's Chamblo. Chamblo, you fool. Kick her out of there. We'll take care of her. I'm taking care of her, drawled Smith. She's Shamblo, I tell you. Damn your hide, man. We never let those things live. Kick her out here. The repeated name had no meaning to him, but Smith's innate stubbornness rose defiantly as the crowd surged forward to the very edge of the ark, their clamor growing louder. Shamblo! Kick her out here! Give us Shamblo! Shamblo! Smith dropped his indolent pose like a cloak and planted both feet wide, swinging up his gun threateningly. Keep back, he yelled. She's mine. Keep back. He had no intention of using that heat beam. He knew by now that they would not kill him unless he started the gunplay himself, and he did not mean to give up his life for any girl alive. But a severe mauling he expected, and he braced himself instinctively as the mob heaved within itself. To his astonishment, a thing happened then that he had never known to happen before. At his shouted defiance, the foremost of the mob, those who had heard him clearly, drew back a little, not in alarm, but evidently surprised. The ex-patrolman said, Yours? She's yours? In a voice from which puzzlement crowded out the anger. Smith spread his booted legs wide before the crouching figure and flourished his gun. Yes, he said and I'm keeping her. Stand back there. The man stared at him wordlessly, and horror, disgust, and incredulity mingled on his weather-beaten face. The incredulity triumphed for a moment, and he said again, Yours? Smith nodded defiance. The man stepped back suddenly, unutterable contempt in his very pose. He waved an arm to the crowd and said loudly, It's his. And the press melted away, gone silent too, and the look of contempt spread from face to face. The ex-patrolman spat on the slag-paved street and turned his back indifferently. Keep her then, he advised briefly over one shoulder, but don't let her out again in this town. Smith stared in perplexity, almost open-mouthed as the suddenly scornful mob began to break up. His mind was in a whirl. That such bloodthirsty animosity should vanish in a breath he could not believe. And the curious mingling of contempt and disgust on the faces he saw baffled him even more. Black Darrell was anything but a Puritan town. It did not enter his head for a moment that his claiming the brown girl as his own had caused that strangely shocked revulsion to spread through the crowd. No, it was something more deeply rooted than that. Instinctive, instant disgust had been in the faces he saw. They would have looked less so if he had admitted cannibalism or feral worship and they were leaving his vicinity 
as swiftly as if whatever unknowing sin he had committed were contagious. The street was emptying as rapidly as it had filled. He saw a sleek Venusian glance back over his shoulder as he turned the corner and sneer, Shamblo. And the word awoke a new line of speculation in Smith's mind. Chamblo. Vaguely of French origin it must be, and strange enough to hear it from the lips of Venusians and Martian drylanders, but it was their use of it that puzzled him more. We never let those things live, the ex-patrolman had said. It reminded him dimly of something, an ancient line from some writing in his own tongue. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. He smiled to himself at the similarity and simultaneously was aware of the girl at his elbow. She had risen soundlessly. He turned to face her, sheathing his gun and stared at first with curiosity and then in the entirely frank openness with which men regard that which is not wholly human. For she was not. He knew it at a glance, though the brown sweet body was shaped like a woman's and she wore a garment of scarlet. He saw it was leather, with an ease that few unhuman beings achieve toward clothing. He knew it from the moment he looked into her eyes, and a shiver of unrest went over him as he met them. They were frankly green as young grass, with slit-like feline pupils that pulsed unceasingly, and there was a look of dark animal wisdom in their depths, that look of the beast which sees more than man. There was no hair upon her face, neither brows nor lashes, and he would have sworn that the tight scarlet turban bound around her head covered baldness. She had three fingers and a thumb, and her feet had four digits apiece too, and all sixteen of them were tipped with round claws that sheathed back into the flesh like a cat's. She ran her tongue over her lips, a thin, pink, flat tongue, as feline as her eyes, and spoke with difficulty. He felt that that throat and tongue had never been shaped for human speech. Not afraid now, she said softly and her little teeth were white and pointed as a kitten's. What did they want you for? He asked her curiously. What had you done? Chamblo, is that your name? I not talk your speech. She demurred hesitantly. Well, try to. I want to know. Why were they chasing you? Will you be safe on the street now, or hadn't you better get indoors somewhere? They look dangerous. I go with you. She brought it out with difficulty. Say you, Smith grinned. What are you anyway? You look like a kitten to me. Chamblo, she said it somberly. Where do you live? Are you a Martian? I come from, from far, from long ago, far country. Wait, laughed Smith. You're getting your wires crossed. You're not a Martian? She drew herself up very straight beside him, lifting the turbaned head, and there was something queenly in the poise of her. Martian, she said scornfully. My people are, are, you have no word. Your speech, hard for me. What's yours? I might know it. Try me. She lifted her head and met his eyes squarely, and there was in hers a subtle amusement. He could have sworn it. Someday I speak to you in my own language, she promised, and the pink tongue flicked out over her lips, swiftly, hungrily. Approaching footsteps on the red pavement interrupted Smith's reply. A dryland Martian came past, reeling a little and exuding an aroma of Segir whiskey, the Venusian brand. When he caught the red flash of the girl's tatters, he turned his head sharply, and as his segir steeped brain took in the fact of her presence, he lurched toward the recess and steadily bawling, Chamblo! By Farrell! Chamblo! and reached out a clutching hand. Smith struck it aside contemptuously. On your way, Drylander, he advised. The man drew back and stared blear eyed. Yours, eh? he croaked. Zut! You're welcome to it. And like the ex-patrolman before him, he spat on the pavement and turned away, muttering harshly in the blasphemous tongue of the drylands. Smith watched him shuffle off, and there was a crease between his colorless eyes, a nameless unease rising within him. Come on, 
he said abruptly to the girl. If this sort of thing is going to happen, we'd better get indoors. Where shall I take you? With you, she murmured. He stared down into the flat green eyes. Those ceaselessly pulsing pupils disturbed him, but it seemed to him vaguely that behind the animal shallows of her gaze was a shudder, a closed barrier that might at any moment open to reveal the very deeps of that dark knowledge he sensed there. Roughly, he said again, come on then, and stepped down to the street. She pattered along a pace or two behind him, making no effort to keep up with his long strides, and though Smith, as men knew from Venus to Jupiter's moons, walks as softly as a cat, even in spaceman's boots, the girl at his heels slid like a shadow over the rough pavement, making so little sound that even the lightness of his footsteps was loud in the empty street. Smith chose the less frequented waves of Loch Darl, and somewhat shamefacedly thanked his nameless gods that his lodgings were not far away, for the few pedestrians he met turned and stared after the two with that by now familiar mingling of horror and contempt which he was as far as ever from understanding. The room he had engaged was a single cubicle in a lodging house on the edge of the city. Loch Darl, rock camp town that it was in those days, could have furnished little better anywhere within its limits, and Smith's air in there was not one which he wished to advertise. He had slept in worse places than this before, and knew that he would do so again. There was no one in sight when he entered, and the girl slipped up the stairs at his heels and vanished through the door, shadowy, unseen by anyone in the house. Smith closed the door and leaned his broad shoulders against the panels, regarding her speculatively. She took in what little the room had to offer in a glance. Frowsy bed, rickety table, mirror hanging unevenly and cracked against the wall, unpainted chairs, a typical camp town room in an earth settlement abroad. She accepted its poverty in that single glance, dismissed it, then crossed to the window and leaned out for a moment gazing across the low rooftops towards the barren countryside beyond, red slag under the late afternoon sun. You can stay here, said Smith abruptly, until I leave town. I'm waiting here for a friend to come in from Venus. Have you eaten? Yes, said the girl quickly. I shall need no food for a while. Well, Smith glanced around the room. I'll be in some time tonight. You can go or stay just as you please. Better lock the door behind me. With no more formality than that, he left her. The door closed and he heard the key turn and smiled to himself. He did not expect then to ever see her again. He went down the steps and out into the late slanting sunlight with a mind so full of other matters that the brown girl receded very quickly into the background. Smith's errand in Lac Darl, like most of his errands, is better not spoken of. Man lives as he must, and Smith's living was a perilous affair, outside the law and ruled by the ray gun only. It is enough to say that the shipping port and its cargoes outbound interested him deeply just now, and that the friend he awaited was Jarl, the Venusian, in that swift little Edsel ship, the Maid, that can flash from world to world with a derisive speed that laughs at patrol boats and leaves pursuers floundering in the ether far behind. Smith and Jarl and the maid were a trinity that had caused the patrol leaders much worry and many gray hairs in the past, and the future looked very bright to Smith himself that evening as he left his lodging house. Loch Darl roars by night, as Earthmen's camp towns have a way of doing on every planet where Earth's outposts are, and it was beginning lustily as Smith went down among the awakening lights toward the center of town. His business there does not concern us. He mingled with the crowds where the lights were brightest and there was the click of ivory counters and the jingle of silver and red sagir gurgled invitingly from black Venusian bottles and much later Smith strolled homeward under the moving moons of Mars and if the street wavered a little under his feet now and then, why, that is only understandable. Not even Smith could drink red sagir at every bar from the Martian Lamb to the New Chicago and remain entirely steady on his feet. But he found his way back with very little difficulty, considering, and spent a good five minutes hunting for his key before he remembered he had left it in the inner lock for the girl. He knocked then, and there was no sound of footsteps from within. But in a few moments, the latch clicked, 
and the door swung open. She retreated soundlessly before him as he entered and took up her favorite place against the window, leaning back on the sill and outlined against the starry sky beyond. The room was in darkness. Smith flipped the switch by the door and then leaned back against the panels, steadying himself. The cool night air had sobered him a little, and his head was clear enough. Liquor went to Smith's feet, not his head, or he would never have come this far along the lawless way he had chosen. He lounged against the door now and regarded the girl in the sudden glare of the bulbs, blinded a little as much at the scarlet of her clothing as at the light. So you stayed, he said. I waited, she answered softly, leaning farther back against the sill and clasping the rough wood with slim three-fingered hands, pale brown against the darkness. Why? She did not answer that, but her mouth curved into a slow smile. On a woman, it would have been reply enough, provocative, daring. On Chamblot, there was something pitiful and horrible in it, so human on the face of one half-animal. And yet, that sweet brown body curved so softly from the tatters of scarlet leather, the velvety texture of that brownness, the white flashing smile. Smith was aware of a stirring excitement within him. After all, Time would be hanging heavy now until Yarol came. Speculatively, he allowed the steel-pale eyes to wander over her with a slow regard that missed nothing. And when he spoke, he was aware that his voice had deepened a little. Come here, he said. She came forward slowly on bare clawed feet that made no sound on the floor and stood before him with downcast eyes and mouth trembling in that pitifully human smile. He took her by the shoulders, velvety soft shoulders of a creamy smoothness that was not the texture of human flesh. A little tremor went over her, perceptibly at the contact of his hands. Northwest Smith caught his breath suddenly and dragged her to him, sweet yielding brownness in the circle of his arms, heard her own breath catch and quicken as her velvety arms closed about his neck. And then he was looking down into her face, very near, and the green animal eyes met his with the pulsing pupils and the flicker of something deep behind their shallows and through the rising clamor of his blood, even as he stooped his lips to hers. Smith felt something deep within him shudder away, inexplicable, instinctive, revolted. What it might be, he had no words to tell, but the very touch of her was suddenly loathsome, so soft and velvet and unhuman, and it might have been an animal's face that lifted itself to his mouth. The dark knowledge looked hungrily from the darkness of those slit pupils, and for a mad instant he knew that same wild, feverish revulsion he had seen in the faces of the mob. God, he gasped, a far more ancient invocation against evil than he realized then or ever, and he ripped her arms from his neck, swung her away with such a force that she reeled half across the room. Smith fell back against the door, breathing heavily, and stared at her while the wild revolt died slowly within him. She had fallen to the floor beneath the window, and as she lay there against the wall with bent head, he saw, curiously, that her turban had slipped, the turban that he had been so sure covered baldness, and a lock of scarlet hair fell below the binding leather, hair as scarlet as her garment, as unhumanly red as her eyes were unhumanly green. He stared and shook his head dizzily and stared again, for it seemed to him that the thick lock of crimson had moved, squirmed of itself against her cheek. At the very contact of it, her hands flew up, and she tucked it away with a very human gesture and then dropped her head again into her hands. And from the deep shadow of her fingers, he thought she was staring up at him covertly. Smith drew a deep breath and passed a hand over his forehead. The inexplicable moment had gone as quickly as it came, too swiftly for him to understand or analyze it. Got to lay off the Sagir, he told himself unsteadily. Had he imagined that scarlet hair? After all, she was no more than a pretty brown girl creature from one of the many half-human races peopling the planets. No more than that, after all. A pretty little thing, but animal. He laughed a little shakily. No more of that, he said, 
God knows I'm no angel, but there's got to be a limit somewhere. Here. He crossed to the bed and sorted out a pair of blankets from the untidy heap, tossing them to the far corner of the room. You can sleep there. Wordlessly, she rose from the floor and began to rearrange the blankets, the uncomprehending resignation of the animal eloquent in every line of her. Smith had a strange dream that night. He thought he had awakened to a room full of darkness and moonlight and moving shadows, for the nearer moon of Mars was racing through the sky and everything on the planet below her was endued with a restless life in the dark. And something, some nameless unthinkable thing, was coiled about his throat, something like a soft snake, wet and warm. It lay loose and light about his neck, and it was moving gently, very gently, with a soft, caressive pressure that sent little thrills of delight through every nerve and fiber of him, a perilous delight, beyond physical pleasure, deeper than joy of the mind. That warm softness was caressing the very roots of his soul with a terrible intimacy. The ecstasy of it left him weak, and yet he knew, in a flash of knowledge born of this impossible dream, that the soul should not be handled. And with that knowledge, a horror broke upon him, turning the pleasure into a rapture of revulsion, hateful, horrible, but still most foully sweet. He tried to lift his hands and tear the dream monstrosity from his throat, tried but half-heartedly, for though his soul was revolted to its very deeps, yet the delight of his body was so great that his hands all but refused the attempt. But when at last he tried to lift his arms, a cold shock went over him, and he found that he could not stir. His body lay stony as marble beneath the blankets, a living marble that shuddered with a dreadful delight through every rigid vein. The revulsion grew strong upon him as he struggled against the paralyzing dream, a struggle of soul against sluggish body, titanically, until the moving dark was streaked with blankness that clouded and closed about him at last, and he sank back into the oblivion from which he had awakened. Next morning, when the bright sunlight shining through Mars's clear, thin air awakened him, Smith lay for a while trying to remember. The dream had been more vivid than reality, but he could not now quite recall, only that it had been more sweet and horrible than anything else in life. He lay puzzling for a while, until a soft sound from the corner aroused him from his thoughts, and he sat up to see the girl lying in a cat-like coil on her blankets, watching him with round, grave eyes. He regarded her somewhat ruefully. Morning, he said. I've just had the devil of a dream. Well, hungry? She shook her head silently, and he could have sworn there was a covert gleam of strange amusement in her eyes. He stretched and yawned, dismissing the nightmare temporarily from his mind. What am I going to do with you? He inquired, turning to more immediate matters. I'm leaving here in a day or two, and I can't take you along, you know. Where'd you come from in the first place? Again, she shook her head. Not telling? Well, it's your business. You can stay here until I give up the room. From then on, you'll have to do your own worrying. He swung his feet to the floor and reached for his clothes. Ten minutes later, slipping the heat gun into its holster at his thigh, Smith turned to the girl. There's food concentrate in that box on the table. It ought to hold you until I get back. And you'd better lock the door again after I've gone. Her wide, unwavering stare was his only answer, and he was not sure she had understood. But at any rate, the lock clicked after him as before, and he went down the steps with a faint grin on his lips. The memory of last night's extraordinary dream was slipping from him, as such memories do, and by the time he had reached the street, the girl and the dream and all of yesterday's happenings were blotted out by the sharp necessities of the present. Again, the intricate business that had brought him here claimed his attention. He went about it to the exclusion of all else, and there was a good reason behind everything he did from the moment he stepped out into the street until the time when he turned back again at evening. Though, had one chosen to follow him during the day, his apparently aimless rambling through Lac Darl would have seemed very pointless. He must have spent two hours at the least idling by the spaceport, watching with sleepy, colorless eyes the ships that came and went, the passengers, the vessels lying at wait, the cargoes, particularly the cargoes. He made the rounds of the town's saloons once more, 
consuming many glasses of varied liquors in the course of the day and engaging in idle conversation with men of all races and worlds, usually in their own languages, for Smith was a linguist of repute among his contemporaries. He heard the gossip of the spaceways, news from a dozen planets of a thousand different events. He heard the latest joke about the Venusian emperor and the latest report on the Chino-Aryan war and the latest song hot from the lips of Rose Robertson, whom every man on the civilized planets adored as the Georgia Rose. He passed the day quite profitably for his own purposes, which do not concern us now. And it was not until late evening when he turned homeward again that the thought of the brown girl in his room took definite shape in his mind, though it had been lurking there, formless and submerged, all day. He had no idea what comprised her usual diet, but he bought a can of New York roast beef and one of Venusian frog broth and a dozen fresh canal apples and two pounds of that earth lettuce that grows so vigorously in the fertile canal soil of Mars. He felt that she must surely find something to her liking in this broad variety of edibles and, for his day had been very satisfactory, he hummed the green hills of earth to himself in a surprisingly good baritone as he climbed the stairs. The door was locked, as before, and he was reduced to kicking the lower panels gently with his boot, for his arms were full. She opened the door with that softness that was characteristic of her and stood regarding him in the semi-darkness as he stumbled to the table with his load. The room was unlit again. Why don't you turn on the lights? He demanded irritably after he had barked his shin on the chair by the table in an effort to deposit his burden there. Light and dark, they are alike to me, she murmured. Cat eyes, eh? Well... You look the part. Here, I've brought you some dinner. Take your choice. Fond of roast beef? Or how about a little frog broth? She shook her head and backed away a step. No, she said. I cannot eat your food. Smith's brows wrinkled. Didn't you have any of the food tablets? Again, the red turban shook negatively. Then you haven't had anything for... Why, more than 24 hours. You must be starved. Not hungry, she denied. What can I find for you to eat then? There's time yet if I hurry. You've got to eat, child. I shall eat, she said softly. Before long, I shall feed. Have no worry. She turned away then and stood at the window, looking out over the moonlit landscape as if to end the conversation. Smith cast her a puzzled glance as he opened the can of roast beef. There had been an odd undernote in that assurance that undefinably he did not like. And the girl had teeth and tongue and presumably a fairly human digestive system to judge from her human form. It was nonsense for her to pretend that he could find nothing that she could eat. She must have had some of the food concentrate after all, he decided, prying up the thermos lid of the inner container to release the long sealed savor of the hot meal inside. Well, if you won't eat, you won't, he observed philosophically as he poured hot broth and diced beef into the dish-like lid of the thermos can and extracted the spoon from its hiding place between the inner and outer receptacles. She turned a little to watch him as he pulled up a rickety chair and sat down to the food, and after a while the realization that her green gaze was fixed so unwinkingly upon him made the man nervous, and he said between bites of creamy canal apple, Why don't you try a little of this? It's good. The food I eat is better. Her soft voice told him in its hesitant murmur, and again he felt rather than heard a faint undertone of unpleasantness in the words. A sudden suspicion struck him as he pondered on that last remark. Some vague memory of horror tales told about campfires in the past, and he swung around in the chair to look at her a tiny creeping fear unaccountably arising. There had been that in her words, in her unspoken words, that menaced. She stood up beneath his gaze demurely, wide green eyes with their pulsing pupils meeting his without a falter. But her mouth was scarlet and her teeth were sharp. What food do you eat? He demanded. And then after a pause, very softly, What? She stared at him for a moment, uncomprehending. 
Then something like amusement curled her lips, and she said scornfully, You think me vampire, eh? No, I am Chamblot. Unmistakably, there was scorn and amusement in her voice at the suggestion, but as unmistakably she knew what he meant, accepted it as a logical suspicion. Vampires. Fairy tales. But fairy tales this inhuman outland creature was most familiar with. Smith was not a credulous man, nor a superstitious one, but he had seen too many strange things himself to doubt that the wildest legend might have a basis of fact. And there was something namelessly strange about her. He puzzled over it for a while between deep bites of the canal apple. And though he wanted to question her about a great many things, he did not, for he knew how futile it would be. He said nothing more until the meat was finished and another canal apple had followed the first and he had cleared away the meal by the simple expedient of tossing the empty can out the window. Then he lay back in the chair and surveyed her from half-closed eyes, colorless in a face tanned like saddle leather. And again he was conscious of the brown, soft curves of her, velvety, subtle arcs and planes of smooth flesh under the tatters of scarlet leather. Vampire she might be, unhuman she certainly was, but desirable beyond words as she sat submissive beneath his low regard, her red turbaned head bent, her clawed fingers lying in her lap. They sat very still for a while, and the silence throbbed between them. She was so like a woman, an earth woman, sweet and submissive and demure, and softer than soft fur if he could forget the three-fingered claws and the pulsing eyes and that deeper strangeness beyond words. Had he dreamed that red lock of hair that moved? Had it been Sagir that woke the wild revulsion he knew when he held her in his arms? Why had the mob so thirsted for her? He sat and stared, and despite the mystery of her and the half-suspicions that thronged his mind, for she was so beautifully soft and curved under those revealing tatters, he slowly realized that his pulses were mounting, became aware of a kindling within, brown girl creature with downcast eyes, and then the lids lifted, and the green flatness of a cat's gaze met his, and last night's revulsion woke swiftly again, like a warning bell that clanged as their eyes met, animal after all, too sleek and soft for humanity, and that inner strangeness. Smith shrugged and sat up, his failings were legion, but the weakness of the flesh was not among the major ones. He motioned the girl to her pallet of blankets in the corner and turned to his own bed. From deeps of sound sleep, he awoke much later. He awoke suddenly and completely, and with that inner excitement that presages something momentous, he awoke to brilliant moonlight, turning the room so bright that he could see the scarlet of the girl's rags as she sat up on her pallet. She was awake, and she was sitting with her shoulder half turned to him, and her head bent, and some warning instinct crawled coldly up his spine as he watched what she was doing. And yet, it was a very ordinary thing for a girl to do. Any girl. Anywhere. She was unbinding her turban. He watched, not breathing, a presentiment of something horrible stirring in his brain, inexplicably. The red folds loosened, and he knew then that he had not dreamed. Again, a scarlet lock swung down against her cheek. A hair, was it? A lock of hair? Thick as a thick worm, it fell, plumply against that smooth cheek, more scarlet than blood, and thick as a crawling worm, and like a worm it crawled. Smith rose on an elbow, not realizing the motion, and fixed an unwinking stare with a sort of sick, fascinated incredulity on that, that lock of hair. He had not dreamed. Until now he had taken it for granted that it was the Sagir which had made it seem to move on that evening before. But now, it was lengthening, stretching, moving of itself. It must be hair, but it crawled. With a sickening life of its own, it squirmed down against her cheek, caressingly, revoltingly, impossibly. Wet it was, and round, and thick, and shining. She unfastened the last fold and whipped the turban off, 
From what he saw then, Smith would have turned his eyes away, and he had looked on dreadful things before without flinching, but he could not stir. He could only lie there on his elbow, staring at the mass of scarlet squirming worms? Hairs? What? that writhed over her head in a dreadful mockery of ringlets. And it was lengthening, falling, somehow growing before his eyes, down over her shoulders in a spilling cascade, a mass that even at the beginning could never have been hidden under the skull-tight turban she had worn. He was beyond wondering, but he realized that. And still it squirmed and lengthened and fell, and she shook it out in a horrible travesty of a woman shaking out her unbound hair, until the unspeakable tangle of it, twisting, writhing, obscenely scarlet, hung to her waist and beyond, and still lengthened, an endless mass of crawling horror that until now, somehow, impossibly, had been hidden under the tight-bound turban. It was like a nest of blind, restless red worms. It was, it was like naked entrails endowed with an unnatural aliveness, terrible beyond words. Smith lay in the shadows, frozen without and within, in a sick numbness that came of utter shock and revulsion. She shook out the obscene, unspeakable tangle over her shoulders, and somehow he knew that she was going to turn in a moment and that he must meet her eyes. The thought of that meeting stopped his heart with dread, more awfully than anything else in this nightmare horror. For nightmare it must be, surely. But he knew without trying that he could not wrench his eyes away. The sickened fascination of that sight held him motionless, and somehow there was a certain beauty. Her head was turning. The crawling awfulness rippled and squirmed at the motion writhing thick and wet and shining over the soft brown shoulders about which they fell now in obscene cascades that all but hid her body. Her head was turning. Smith lay numb, and very slowly he saw the round of her cheek foreshorten and her profile come into view, all the scarlet horrors twisting ominously, and the profile shortened in turn, and her full face came slowly round toward the bed. Moonlight shining brilliantly as day on the pretty girl face, demure and sweet, framed in a tangled obscenity that crawled. The green eyes met his. He felt a perceptible shock, and a shudder rippled down his paralyzed spine, leaving an icy numbness in its wake. He felt the goose flesh rising, but that numbness and cold horror he scarcely realized, for the green eyes were locked with his in a long, long look that somehow presaged nameless things, not altogether unpleasant things, the voiceless voice of her mind assailing him with little murmurous promises. For a moment, he went down into a blind abyss of submission, and then somehow the very sight of that obscenity in eyes that did not then realize they saw it was dreadful enough to draw him out of the seductive darkness, the sight of her crawling and alive with unnameable horror. She rose, and down upon her in a cascade fell the squirming scarlet of, of what grew upon her head. It fell in a long, alive cloak to her bare feet on the floor, hiding her in a wave of dreadful, wet, writhing life. She put up her hands, and like a swimmer, she parted the waterfall of it, tossing the masses back over her shoulders to reveal her own brown body, sweetly curved. She smiled exquisitely, and in starting waves back from her forehead and down about her in a hideous background, writhed the snaky wetness of her living tresses, and Smith knew that he looked upon Medusa. The knowledge of that, the realization of vast backgrounds reaching into misted history, shook him out of his frozen horror for a moment, and in that moment he met her eyes again, smiling, green as glass in the moonlight, half hooded under drooping lids. Through the twisting scarlet she held out her arms, and there was something soul-shakingly desirable about her, so that all the blood seeped to his head suddenly, and he stumbled to his feet like a sleeper in a dream as she swayed toward him, infinitely graceful, infinitely sweet in her cloak of living horror. And somehow there was beauty in it, the wet scarlet writhings with moonlight sliding and shining along the thick worm-round tresses and losing itself in the masses 
only to glint again and move silvery along writhing tendrils, an awful shuddering beauty more dreadful than any ugliness could be. But all this, again, he but half realized, for the insidious murmur was coiling again through his brain, promising, caressing, alluring, sweeter than honey, and the green eyes that held his were clear and burning, like the depths of a jewel, and behind the pulsing slits of darkness, he was staring into a greater dark that held all things. He had known, dimly he had known when he first gazed into those flat animal shallows, that behind them lay this, all beauty and terror, all horror and delight, in the infinite darkness upon which her eyes opened like windows, paned with emerald glass. Her lips moved, and in a murmur that blended indistinguishably with the silence and the sway of her body and the dreadful sway of her, her hair, she whispered very softly, very passionately, I shall speak to you now in my own tongue, O beloved. In her living cloak she swayed to him, the murmur swelling, seductive and caressing in his innermost brain, promising, compelling, sweeter than sweet. His flesh crawled to the horror of her, but it was a perverted revulsion that clasped what it loathed, wet and warm and hideously alive, and the sweet velvet body was clinging to his, her arms locked about his neck, and with a whisper and a rush, the unspeakable horror closed about them both. In nightmares until he died, he remembered that moment when the living tresses of Chamblot first folded him in their embrace. A nauseous smothering odor as the wetness shut around him, thick pulsing worms clasping every inch of his body, sliding, writhing, their wetness and warmth striking through his garments as if he stood naked to their embrace. All this in a grave an instant, and after that a tangled flash of conflicting sensation before oblivion closed over him. For he remembered the dream and knew it for nightmare reality now, and the sliding, gently moving caresses of those wet, warm worms upon his flesh was an ecstasy above words, that deeper ecstasy that strikes beyond the body and beyond the mind and tickles the very roots of the soul with unnatural delight. So he stood, rigid as marble, as helplessly stony as any of Medusa's victims in ancient legends were, while the terrible pleasure of Chamblot thrilled and shuddered through every fiber of him, through every atom of his body, and the intangible atoms of what men call the soul. Through all that was Smith the dreadful pleasure ran, and it was truly dreadful. Dimly he knew it, even as his body answered to the root-deep ecstasy, a foul and dreadful wooing from which his very soul shuddered away. And yet in the innermost depths of that soul, some grinning traitor shivered with delight. But deeply behind all this, he knew horror and revulsion and despair beyond telling, while the intimate caresses crawled obscenely in the secret places of his soul knew that the soul should not be handled, and shook with the perilous pleasure through it all. And this conflict and knowledge, this mingling of rapture and revulsion, all took place in the flashing of a moment, while the scarlet worms coiled and crawled upon him, sending deep obscene tremors of that infinite pleasure into every atom that made up Smith. And he could not stir in that slimy, ecstatic embrace, and a weakness was flooding that grew deeper after each succeeding wave of intense delight. And the traitor in his soul strengthened and drowned out the revulsion, and something within him ceased to struggle as he sank wholly into a blazing darkness that was oblivion to all else but that devouring rapture. The young Venusian climbing the stairs to his friend's lodging room pulled out his key absentmindedly, a pucker forming between his fine brows. He was slim as all Venusians are, as fair and sleek as any of them, 
and as with most of his countrymen, the look of cherubic innocence on his face was wholly deceptive. He had the face of a fallen angel, without Lucifer's majesty to redeem it, for a black devil grinned in his eyes, and there were faint lines of ruthlessness and dissipation about his mouth, to tell of the long years behind him that had run the gamut of experiences and made his name, next to Smith's, the most hated and the most respected in the records of the patrol. He mounted the stairs now with a puzzled frown between his eyes. He had come into Loch Darrell on the noon liner. The maid in her hold very skillfully disguised with paint and otherwise to find in lamentable disorder the affairs he had expected to be settled. And cautious inquiry elicited the information that Smith had not been seen for three days. That was not like his friend. He had never failed before, and the two stood to lose not only a large sum of money, but also their personal safety by the inexplicable lapse on the part of Smith. Yarrell could think of one solution only. Fate had at last caught up with his friend. Nothing but physical disability could explain it. Still puzzling, he fitted his key in the lock and swung the door open. In that first moment as the door opened, he sensed something very wrong. The room was darkened, and for a while he could see nothing, but at the first breath he scented a strange, unnameable odor, half sickening, half sweet, and deep stirrings of ancestral memory awoke within him, ancient swamp-born memories from Venusian ancestors far away and long ago. Yarrow laid his hand on his gun, lightly, and opened the door wider. In the dimness, all he could see at first was a curious mound in the far corner, Then his eyes grew accustomed to the dark, and he saw it more clearly, a mound that somehow heaved and stirred within itself. A mound of, he caught his breath sharply, a mound like a mass of entrails, living, moving, writhing with an unspeakable aliveness. Then a hot Venusian oath broke from his lips, and he cleared the door sill in a swift stride, slammed the door and set his back against it, gun ready in his hand, although his flesh crawled, for he knew. Smith, he said softly, in a voice thick with horror. Northwest. The moving mass stirred, shuddered, sank back into crawling quiescence again. Smith, Smith. The Venusian's voice was gentle and insistent, and it quivered a little with terror. An impatient ripple went over the whole mass of aliveness in the corner. It stirred again, reluctantly, and then, tendril by writhing tendril, it began to part itself and fall aside, and very slowly the brown of a spaceman's leather appeared beneath it, all slimed and shining. Smith! Northwest! Jarl's persistent whisper came again, urgently, and with a dreamlike slowness the leather garments moved. A man sat up in the midst of the writhing worms, a man who once, long ago, might have been Northwest Smith. From head to foot, he was slimy from the embrace of the crawling horror about him. His face was that of some creature beyond humanity, dead alive, fixed in a gray stare, and the look of terrible ecstasy that overspread it seemed to come from somewhere far within, a faint reflection from immeasurable distances beyond the flesh. And as there is mystery and magic in the moonlight, which is after all but a reflection of the everyday sun, so in that gray face turned to the door was a terror unnameable and sweet, a reflection of ecstasy beyond the understanding of any who have known only earthly ecstasy themselves. And as he sat there turning a blank, eyeless face to Jarl, the red worms writhed ceaselessly about him, very gently, with a soft, caressive motion that never slacked. Smith, come here. Smith, get up. Smith, Smith. Jarl's whisper hissed in the silence, commanding, urgent, but he made no move to leave the door. And with a dreadful slowness, like a dead man rising, Smith stood up in the nest of slimy scarlet. He swayed drunkenly on his feet, and two or three crimson tendrils came writhing up his legs to the knees and wound themselves there, supportingly, moving with a ceaseless caress that seemed to give him some hidden strength, for he said then, without inflection, Go away. Go away. <laughs>
leave me alone. And the dead, ecstatic face never changed. Smith! Harold's voice was desperate. Smith, listen. Smith, can't you hear me? Go away, the monotonous voice said. Go away. Go away. Go. Not unless you come too. Can't you hear? Smith? Smith, I'll... He hushed in mid-phrase, and once more the ancestral prickle of race memory shivered down his back, for the scarlet mass was moving again, violently rising. Yarl pressed back against the door and gripped his gun, and the name of a god he had forgotten years ago rose to his lips unbidden, for he knew what was coming next, and the knowledge was more dreadful than any ignorance could have been. The red, writhing mass rose higher, and the tendrils parted, and a human face looked out. No, half-human, with green cat eyes that shone in that dimness like lighted jewels, compellingly. Yarl breathed, Shar, again, and flung up an arm across his face, and the tingle of meeting that green gaze for even an instant went thrilling through him perilously. Smith, he called in despair. Smith, can't you hear me? Go away, said a voice that was not Smith's. Go away. And somehow, although he dared not look, Jarl knew that the, the other, had parted those warm, thick tresses and stood there in all the human sweetness of the brown, curved woman's body, cloaked in living horror. And he felt the eyes upon him, and something was crying insistently in his brain to lower that shielding arm. He was lost. He knew it. And the knowledge gave him that courage which comes from despair. The voice in his brain was growing, swelling, deafening him with a roaring command that all but swept him before it command to lower that arm, to meet the eyes that opened upon darkness, to submit, and a promise, murmurous and sweet, and evil beyond words, of pleasure to come. But somehow he kept his head. Somehow dizzily, he was gripping his gun in his upflung hand. Somehow incredibly, crossing the narrow room with averted face, groping for Smith's shoulder. There was a moment of blind fumbling and emptiness, and then he found it and gripped the leather that was slimy and dreadful and wet. And simultaneously he felt something loop gently about his ankle, and a shock of repulsive pleasure went through him. And then another coil, and another wound about his feet. Jarl set his teeth and gripped the shoulder hard, and his hand shuddered of itself, for the feel of that leather was slimy as the worms about his ankles, and a faint tingle of obscene delight went through him from the contact. That caressive pressure on his legs was all he could feel, and the voice in his brain drowned out all other sounds, and his body obeyed him reluctantly. But somehow he gave one heave of tremendous effort and swung Smith, stumbling out of that nest of horror. The twining tendrils ripped loose with a little sucking sound, and the whole mess quivered and reached after. And then Jarl forgot his friend utterly and turned his whole being to the hopeless task of freeing himself. For only a part of him was fighting now. Only a part of him struggled against the twining obscenities, and in his innermost brain the sweet, seductive murmur sounded, and his body clamored to surrender. Shar, Shayan Danis, Shar Morlaro, prayed Jarl, gasping and half unconscious that he spoke, boy's prayers he had forgotten years ago, and with his back half turned to the central mass, he kicked desperately with his heavy boots at the red writhing worms about him. They gave back before him, quivering and curling themselves out of reach, and though he knew that more were reaching for his throat from behind, at least he could go on struggling until he was forced to meet those eyes. He stamped and kicked and stamped again, and for one instant he was free of the slimy grip as the bruised worms curled back from his heavy feet, and he lurched away dizzily, sick with revulsion and despair, as he fought off the coils, and then he lifted his eyes and saw the cracked mirror on the wall. Dimly in its reflection, he could see the writhing scarlet horror behind him, cat face peering out with its demure girl smile, dreadfully human, and all the red tendrils reaching after him. And remembrance of something he had read long ago swept incongruously over him, and the gasp of relief and hope 
that he gave shook for a moment the grip of the command in his brain. Without pausing for a breath, he swung the gun over his shoulder, the reflected barrel in line with the reflected horror in the mirror, and flicked the catch. In the mirror, he saw its blue flame leap in a dazzling spate across the dimness, full into the midst of that squirming, reaching mass behind him. There was a hiss and a blaze and a high, thin scream of inhuman malice and despair. The flame cut a wide arc and went out as the gun fell from his hand and Jarl pitched forward to the floor. Northwest Smith opened his eyes to Martian sunlight streaming thinly through the dingy window. Something wet and cold was slapping his face and the familiar fiery sting of Sagir whiskey burnt his throat. Smith, Jarl's voice was saying from far away. N.W., wake up, damn you, wake up. I'm awake, Smith managed to articulate thickly. What's the matter? Then a cup rim was thrust against his teeth, and Jarl said irritably, Drink it, you fool. Smith swallowed obediently, and more of the fire-hot Sagir flowed down his grateful throat. It spread a warmth through his body that awakened him from the numbness that had gripped him until now, and helped a little toward driving out the all-devouring weakness he was becoming aware of slowly. He lay still for a few minutes while the warmth of the whiskey went through him, and memory sluggishly began to permeate his brain with the spread of the Sagir. Nightmare memories, sweet and terrible. Memories of... God! gasped Smith suddenly and tried to sit up. Weakness smote him like a blow, and for an instant the room wheeled as he fell back against something firm and warm. Yarrow's shoulder. The Venusian's arm supported him while the room steadied, and after a while he twisted a little and stared into the other's black gaze. Jarl was holding him with one arm and finishing the mug of Sagir himself, and the black eyes met his over the rim and crinkled in a sudden laughter, half hysterical after that terror that was past. By Farrell, gasped Jarl, choking into his mug. By Farrell, N.W., I'm never going to let you forget this. Next time you have to drag me out of a mess, I'll say... Let it go, said Smith. What's been going on? How? Shamblow, Jarl's laughter died. Shamblow, what were you doing with a thing like that? What was it? Smith asked soberly. Mean to say you didn't know? But where'd you find it? How... Suppose you tell me first what you know, said Smith firmly. And another swig of that Sagir too, please. I need it. Can you hold the mug now? Feel better? Yeah, some. I can hold it. Thanks. Now go on. Well, I don't know just where to start. They call them Chamblot. Good God, is there more than one? It's... A, a sort of race, I think. One of the very oldest. Where they come from, nobody knows. The name sounds a little French, doesn't it? But it goes back beyond the start of history. There have always been Shamblo. I never heard of them. Not many people have. And those who know don't care to talk about it much. Well, half this town knows. I hadn't any idea what they were talking about then. And I still don't understand, but... Yes, it happens like this sometimes. They'll appear, and the news will spread, and the town will get together and hunt them down. And after that, well, the story doesn't get around very far. It's too... too unbelievable. But, my God, Jarl, what was it? Where did it come from? How? Nobody knows just where they come from. Another planet? Maybe some undiscovered one? Some say Venus. I know there are some rather awful legends of them handed down in our family, and that's how I've heard about it. And the minute I opened that door a while back, I... I think I knew that smell. But... what are they? God knows. Not human, though they have the human form. Or that may be only an illusion. Or maybe I'm crazy. I don't know. They're a species of the vampire. Or maybe the vampire is a species of... of them. Their normal form must be that. That mass. And in that form they draw nourishment from the... 
I suppose the life forces of men. And they take some form, usually a woman form, I think, and key you up to the highest pitch of emotion before they begin. That's to work the life force up to intensity so it'll be easier. And they give always that horrible, foul pleasure as they feed. There are some men who, if they survive the first experience, take to it like a drug, can't give it up, keep the thing with them all their lives, which isn't long, feeding it for that ghastly satisfaction, worse than smoking Ming or, or praying to Farrell. Yes, said Smith, I'm beginning to understand why that crowd was so surprised and, and disgusted when I said, well, never mind. Go on. Did you get to talk to... to it? Asked Yarl. I tried to. It couldn't speak very well. I asked it where it came from, and it said, from far away and long ago, something like that. I wonder. Possibly some unknown planet. But I think not. You know there are so many wild stories with some basis of fact to start from that I've sometimes wondered... Mightn't there be a lot more of even worse and wilder superstitions we've never even heard of? Things like this, blasphemous and foul, that those who know have to keep still about. Awful, fantastic things running around loose that we never hear rumors of at all. These things, they've been in existence for countless ages. No one knows when or where they first appeared. Those who've seen them as we saw this one don't talk about it. It's just one of those vague, misty rumors you find half-hinted at in old books sometimes. I believe they are an older race than man, spawned from ancient seed in times before ours, perhaps on planets that have gone to dust, and so horrible to man that when they are discovered, the discoverers keep still about it, forget them again as quickly as they can. And they go back to time immemorial. I suppose you recognize the legend of Medusa, there isn't any question that the ancient Greeks knew of them. Does it mean that there have been civilizations before yours that set out from Earth and explored other planets? Or did one of the Chamblos somehow make its way into Greece 3,000 years ago? If you think about it long enough, you'll go off your head. I wonder how many other legends are based on things like this. Things we don't suspect. Things we'll never know. The Gorgon. Medusa. A beautiful woman with with snakes for hair, and a gaze that turned men to stone, and Perseus finally killed her. I remembered this just by accident, N.W., and it saved your life and mine. Perseus killed her by using a mirror as he fought to reflect what he dared not look at directly. I wonder what the old Greek who first started that legend would have thought if he had known that 3,000 years later, his story would save the lives of two men on another planet. I wonder what that Greek's own story was and how he met the thing and what happened. Well, there's a lot we'll never know. Wouldn't the records of that race of, of things, whatever they are, be worth reading? Records of other planets and other ages and all the beginnings of mankind. But I don't suppose they've kept any records. I don't suppose they've even any place to keep them. From what little I know or anyone knows about it, they're like the wandering Jew just bobbing up here and there at long intervals, and where they stay in the meantime, I'd give my eyes to know. But I don't believe that terribly hypnotic power they have indicates any superhuman intelligence. It's their means of getting food, just like a frog's long tongue or a carnivorous flower's odor. Those are physical because the frog and the flower eat physical food. The Chamblot uses a, a mental reach to get mental food. I don't quite know how to put it, and just as a beast that eats the bodies of other animals acquires with each meal greater power over the bodies of the rest, so the Chamblot, stoking itself up with the life forces of men, increases its power over the minds and the souls of other men. But I'm talking about things I can't define, things I'm not sure exist. I only know that when I felt, when those tentacles closed around my legs, I didn't want to pull loose. I felt sensations that, that, oh, I'm fouled and filthy to the very deepest part of me by that pleasure. And yet, I know, said Smith slowly, 
The effect of the Sagir was beginning to wear off, and weakness was washing back over him in waves. And when he spoke, he was half meditating in a low voice, scarcely realizing that Jarl listened. I know it much better than you do, and there's something so indescribably awful that the thing emanates, something so utterly at odds with everything human. There aren't any words to say it. For a while I was part of it, literally, sharing its thoughts and memories and emotions and hungers and, well, it's over now and I don't remember very clearly, but the only part left free was that part of me that was but insane from the, the obscenity of the thing. And yet, it was a pleasure so sweet. I think there must be some nucleus of utter evil in me, in everyone, that needs only the proper stimulus to get complete control. Because even while I was sick all through from the touch of those things, there was something in me that was simply gibbering with delight. Because of that, I saw things and knew things, horrible wild things I can't quite remember, visited unbelievable places, looked backward through the memory of that creature I was one with and saw. God, I wish I could remember. You ought to thank your God you can't, said Jarl soberly. His voice roused Smith from the half-trance he had fallen into, and he rose on his elbow, swaying a little from weakness. The room was wavering before him, and he closed his eyes, not to see it, but he asked, You say they, they don't turn up again? No way of finding another? Jarl did not answer for a moment. He laid his hands on the other man's shoulders and pressed him back, and then sat staring down into the dark, ravaged face with a new, strange, undefinable look upon it that he had never seen there before, whose meaning he knew too well. Smith, he said finally, and his black eyes for once were steady and serious, and the little grinning devil had vanished from behind them. Smith, I've never asked your word on anything before, but I've, I've earned the right to do it now, and I'm asking you to promise me one thing. Smith's colorless eyes met the black gaze unsteadily. Irresolution was in them, and a little fear of what that promise might be. And for just a moment, Jarl was looking, not into his friend's familiar eyes, but into a wide gray blankness that held all horror and delight a pale sea with unspeakable pleasures sunk beneath it. Then the wide stare focused again, and Smith's eyes met his squarely, and Smith's voice said, Go ahead, I'll promise that if you ever should meet a Shamblo again, ever, anywhere, you'll draw your gun and burn it to hell the instant you realize what it is. Will you promise me that? There was a long silence. Jarl's somber black eyes bored relentlessly into the colorless ones of Smith, not wavering, and the veins stood out on Smith's tanned forehead. He never broke his word. He had given it perhaps half a dozen times in his life, but once he had given it, he was incapable of breaking it. And once more the gray seas flooded in a dim tide of memories, sweet and horrible beyond dreams. Once more, Jarl was staring into blankness that hid nameless things. The room was very still. The gray tide ebbed. Smith's eyes, pale and resolute as steel, met Jarl's levelly. I'll try, he said, and his voice wavered. <laughs>